for um, Councilman Larry Cox, District 8. And Larry Clark, who cares, and Buddy Pinnell, when she was alive, cared deeply for the National Council of Negro Women. Oh my God, I forgot something. Our, please forgive me, San, Evangelist Sandy Green is going to come and open this up. The National Council of Negro Women opens everything with prayer. So, I got excited. Praise God. We cannot open up without thanking God and giving him praise. Because what God gives the Lord, this will not be taking place. We want to say thank you, God, this morning for the Sacramento Valley Section National Council of Negro Women. Uh, also, to the 18 National Children's Promise Conference and you speaking in their own voice. Father God, we just give you thanks and praise this morning, oh God. Lord, we ask you, oh God, to bless everything that was said and done, oh God. Open our hearts to receive the word that will go forth from the youth, oh God. Father, we just thank you for everyone that took place and have a party in this, oh God, that you would bless it, oh God. Let this be an awesome, awesome, mighty day in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you, God, that we are on this side, Lord. We are breathing, we are healthy, we have our health and strength, oh God. Bless every speaker that will go forward, every word, open our hearts, bless those who are on their way, Father God. And we just thank you for this mighty event, this conference, oh God, that as we go forward, oh God, we'll share, God, with every year, God, we'll grow, God. Name. We thank you for the seed that's planted, oh God. We thank you for everything that will go forward this morning, oh God. In the mighty, mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. That's not on your program, but uh, uh, just to say hello. This is Cheryl Denise Hughes. She's a nurse at Kaiser Permanente. And a very good one. We were doing the cancer. Come on, come on. She was doing the cancer walk, and a man just came up and said, You were my nurse. Thank you for being so kind to me. So that is a, a good thing. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, thank you for coming out for our 18th Annual Children of Promise Conference. I'm excited. Are you guys excited? Yeah. Looking forward to hearing our youth speak in their own voices. Yes. Amen? Yes. yes. All right. Thank you, Miss Tommy. All right. Miss Tony, who speaks Italian fluently. Raised enough money to get herself traveled to Italy, and is, is now an intern with uh, Councilman Larry Carr. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. All right, so I'm so glad to be here today, and I hope everyone got themselves some breakfast. I heard it's the most important meal of the day. Um, but before I get started, I would like to see some really quickly. So raise your hand if you expected for the council member Larry Carr to be speaking to you right now. Yeah, me too. I so what you said. Raise your hand if you expected for the council member Larry Carr to be speaking to you right now. Okay. Yes. Yeah. We're all on the same page coming straight out of the gate. So this is a surprise for me as well. Um, the council member regrets that he wasn't able to make it today, but as Ms. Whitlow introduced me, my name is Joelle Tony. I am a recent UC Davis graduate. Thank you. Um, I also consider myself a youth educator. This summer, I participated in my first Freedom Summer, and I had a classroom with about 12 youth, and it was absolutely incredible how much they were able to teach me over the summer. Um, after that experience, I was fortunate enough to be hired um, by the councilman's office as the outreach coordinator. And I always love to remember the people, the organizations, and the mentors who have supported me and molded me to be a confident African woman in this country. Um, and the history, the rich history of African Americans and our bright future that legacy, I would like to thank Ms. Tommy Whitlow and the National Council of Negro Women, the, the National Association of Black Social Workers, the California Endowment, and the Pinnell Medical View Community Center, and all of the influential supporters who have made an event like this possible. So according to the Pew Research Center, our demographic, young people, are the most 
powerful and energetic group that is capable of changing the trajectory of politics in this country. All right. We not only outnumber all age demographics as registered voters, but we outnumber the baby boomers, and we're the only demographic that is capable of changing everything that's going on. So that's why conferences like this are so important. To hear young voices, experiences, ideas, and truths. Our voices matter, right? So times are changing, and the young people who are going to come up here and speak to us today are going to impart nuggets of wisdom and insight for all of us. They're not just the leaders of tomorrow, but they're the leaders of today. Yes. So as a community, we must do everything we can to empower and uplift young people. At the council office, we don't just do this as an idea. We show this through our actions. So in the coming weeks, the North Laguna Valley High Library will be hosting the much anticipated grand opening of the Boys and Girls Club, which our office supported from start to finish. In addition, we have contributed over $100,000 each in funds to the Sacramento Impact Program in Meadowview and Mac Road communities, which provides quality programming to young people ages 5 through 17 in art, journalism, sports, and many other activities. In addition, we have been funding STEM programs, which gives young people exposure to the fastest growing careers, not just in this country, not just in this state, but all over the world. Yes. So, I could go on and on and on and on and on and on and on about what our council office is doing to support young people, important um, youth education programs and activities in the state, in the city, I mean. So, in closing, I want to share our deepest appreciation for the organizers of this conference, and I'm looking forward to learning from the young people who are going to come up next. Thank you. I like very much the comment you made about the baby boomers being outnumbered by the younger generation. Being a baby boomer myself, that's telling that uh, not many of us are around and many of us are leaving. And I don't like the thought that I'm leaving. I, I have that potential to be real, real soon. One of the things I want to remind you of, as chair of the Black Girls School Board, one of responsibilities that I have is to educate uh, the public. I had an opportunity to do a presentation on race a couple of weeks ago, and I was real stunned when I got to the bottom piece of that discussion and said that race is made up label, that people were real confused about that. And so today, I brought, because I want you to see an article by the National Geographic that said very clearly that race is a made up label. And that it was made up for a particular purpose. And I wanted to make sure that if anybody wants to get a copy of that particular article, you can grab this document and it's on the Black Journal School Board table. You can grab one of these before you leave. Now what's so significant about the National Geographic is that they were the ones responsible for creating the myth in the first place. The National Geographic goes back to 1888. And now they finally decided to apologize to all US citizens and citizens of the world and finally tell the truth. So if you want to grab that off our table, we'd appreciate that. We'd appreciate it. What we have here sitting in front of you are two people that I've had the honor to work with uh, extensively for the last several years. And then I have Crandall Rankins. And Crandall Rankins, as most of you already know, has been around for a long time. He's a native of Chicago. He's a father and brother, pastor, mentor, and community elder. He's a spoken word artist and motivational speaker. Crandall earned a master's degree in counseling and Christian education. He has led and served in youth leadership character development and behavior modification program for over 32 years. He is now serving as an educational consultant assisting in the development of the Men's Leadership Academy in the Sacramento Unified School District. 
Bradley was the co-founder and executive director of Crossover Scholar Athletes, Power Forward program, and the Power Forward program. Through his programs, he has assisted over 2,000 students to attend colleges and universities across the United States. A number of athletes have gone on to professional sports and others along the, the non-athletes have received master's degrees and PhDs. They are now pastors, community leaders, entrepreneurs, and middle and upper corporate management roles, and most in some ways are making a difference in, their, in our world. Crowder teaches the students that anything is possible to dream and dream big. He further instructs, as your dreams are coming true and you are reaching your goals, don't step on or over people. Reach out, help those around you all along the way. Crandall is a mentor and spiritual father to move more than he can count. I'm sorry. He's a mentor and spiritual father to more people than he can count. He says, I'm here to carry on the legacy of Dr. King and others who have paved the way for our people and train up the next generation to do the same. So I introduce to you Isaac Soto and uh, Crandall Yes. Yeah. followed by the mentor, who will have 10 minutes. And so are we ready? Hearing nothing, we're not ready, so let me tell you uh, another story oh my God. until we get you ready, but I won't do that. All right, Isaiah. Events, a 
lot of community involvement. And not only within this community, but other communities that I've lived in, other places I've been, and just seeing the different areas, I just put myself in a position to where if I see a problem, I can be in a place where I can get solutions, where I can come up with those solutions. So um, that was really my thing, like with Crandall, is getting me in that place to where now I actually have a goal, I have a purpose, I know some sort of direction for my life. Um, so it was really, really good doing that. And just me as a person is shaping who I am. So that's kind of why I, I want to empower those around me. I'm an advocate for any problem that I see and want to change. I do my best to put myself in a place where I can make that change the right way, the way that's effective. And that's really me as a person. I'm very family oriented as well. So those who are either blood family or considered family because I care so much about things in movement. So that's pretty much me and who I am. And I'll tell you a little bit more about me. Um, so first, I want to start off by telling you guys a, a story that I wrote, so I'm going to read to you. Um, all right, I'm, just stay with me. This is it's kind of long, but the story is about a boy. It's a boy who was born in poverty. This boy's mother dealt with an in inconsistency when it came to parental support. As she had a lack of guidance, she did with a devil in the unhealthy walks of life, such as abuse, drug use, criminal activity, and physical violence. She also, she also was involved in young, unprotected sex. And she had her first child at age 17. And if you're wondering how this ties into the little boy, we're getting there. Because a year later, a year later she gives birth to a boy. The boy, in turn, of the mother's choices, lives in poverty. And this boy went nights with little to no food. The mother then woke up and began to want to change her lifestyle, to better her, better suit the livelihood of her children. So she starts to seek financial stability. So she searches for work. As she leaves, as she searches for work, she leaves her children in the care of her mother. In the care of her grandmother, or in the care of his grandmother, the boy witnesses molestation from the grandmother's boyfriend and also experiences it. The boy is odd when this takes place, and it's something that will stick with the boy forever. It turned out the boyfriend of the grandmother had also molested the boy's mother. Growing up, the boy had trouble coping and would go into a state of silence. The mother then moved away to get her children away, or to get her children away early on. And at age nine, the boy deals with the loss of a friend due to cancer. And at age 14 to 17, the boy experiences death of multiple close friends due to shootings. The boy, the boy lives better now, but still in poverty on the brinks of going downhill financially. Along this journey, the mother finally realizes what she pours into her children makes the difference. And overall, the well-being of her children, or overall the well-being of her children, despite the boy went through the different traumas he faced to the point of getting shot at, the boy is able to stand strong and move positively in the direction of life because maybe financially he's not stable, but there's stability in the motives and intents of the mother of the mother to build her son's character. Now this boy of ours plans to attend college and is involved in community change. Talks amongst those in legislation as well as as well as connects and pushes those around him to do to the in the direction of prosperity. That being said, the boy was able to make it through hardships, but could not do it alone. He needed the support of his loving parent. This boy is so dear to me because I was that little boy. Now I have now I've grown into a young man seeking my manhood on my path and moving in the right direction. And you see the support. The support is what we need to prosper. I even came to a realize, realization just recently. I went back to my hometown in Bakersfield, and I was out there getting experience in construction based area buildings. And it happened so on plan that I had this feeling that I had to go see my great grandmother, go see your great grandmother. My great grandmother has suffered dearly 
is not you too, you know, she's been at her deathbed about six times, multiple seizures. She can barely talk, but I knew for some reason I had to go see her. So I went and I see my brother. And as I talked to her, she explains her, her past as she's trying to talk, and my other grandmother was with me, who was able to tell me a little bit more about where do I come from? I hadn't seen her since I was four. So, in that situation, I learned something. Is that we do need our parents' support, but we also need generational support for the things that we're going through. Yeah. And it was just eye-opening to me to really grasp it all, just understanding the different things she faced but still, her body's so frail, but spirit so strong, still. Because that's where our strengths come from. It's generational strength that we need to have understanding of in order to move forward and be able to access our power because everybody has it within them. You just have to know about it. You have to be educated on how do I use it. And that only happens with the connection between between the parents and also the grandparents, as much as, as far as we can go back, that's what needs to take place is that connect, it's a disconnect between these generations within that. And once we fix that connection and able to connect and see where, where do I come from? All right, now, what, what type of strengths do I have and how can I use them? That's when we move forward impactful, like we'll be able to actually really make strong change because everybody will hold each other accountable and that's what we're really missing. But it came to me in, in that situation that I learned that we just need generational support. Um, so that was kind of just a little background. I was a little vulnerable there, but um, we really just need to come together as one, it, it should work as a unit, but we have to know where we came from first. So I would say one thing as adults um, that we can do is build, build that uh, gap, uh, bridge to where it's, we know where we come from and we also know where we're going. And that, that's really the only way that it works properly. So what we're looking for really is on both ends, our younger generation of people being able to be willing to accept that information, to be susceptible to that information. And when that happens, we'll be able to make positive change in people. So, yeah. yeah. So I have a question as well. Can I want you to tell me about student voice and how important it is, especially Adults are always making decisions that impact you. What do you want to tell them in terms of uh, how much and how far they should go with student voice? Um, going on how I feel about student voice, um, student voice does matter. Uh, you don't necessarily have a, any school system without the students in. Uh, if you don't have the students, there's no school. There's nobody to teach without the students. And oftentimes, when things are made and things are put in place, they don't involve the viewpoints of the student. And that's something that needs to change because you don't realize what you're designing for that you think will work for these students may not work for those students. If you're not willing to open that bridge and ask them what would work for you, you'll never know how to make it work. And that's how I feel about student voice. I've had my encounters with it even, I go to the Central Charter High School, and even dealing with things there, even being involved in leading the protest, I don't want to talk too much about it because it's, it's quite lengthy, but um, you, you, become, or you understand on the level of these people in power, it's just having, you have to reach out to all people that are going to be affected by it. You can't just solely be selfish and worry about what's affecting you or your pay or your money. It has to be more than that. And 
more than money. So that's the time for our student voice movement should be very involved and should advocate for themselves in a very educated way and respectful way, but they should stand up as students. Um, for me, um, I'm one of the very proud of Isaiah and the accomplishments that he's made, the things that he's been able to do, the storms that he's been able to go through and come out standing and standing up strong and continue to see how he can use to make his world a better place. And in the discussions that we have and the things that we uh, learn in, in our Zero Tolerance School, um, the things that Mr. Peterson, share with the students, uh, and then I, I take them back over and make sure that it gets down inside. Them. It's not just surface knowledge, but under, that they get an understanding of their importance of the issues that they're dealing with and addressing. And then from there, then they can make real decisions. They can actually come up with solutions that work. And so um, Isaiah is the third generation of students that we worked with at Sacramento High School. And, and yet yeah, they do a hand on that. Because, because of, of the continuous flow of building these young people to be leaders that have voice, they've been able to conduct um, professional development for teachers and administrators dealing with implicit bias, dealing with um, restorative justice and, and other measures that, that fix things that really matter for them. And so it's important, it's important that we as, I'm a baby boomer too, and that, that we as adults are enabling our students all along the way. And now I'm reaching to parents, we actually have a parent court here that's reaching to parents and working with parents from the Black Trouble School Board. Now we're doing, we're, um, I'm working with a, a team of um, uh, alumni from SAC High to build an alumni association so that they can help support their, their young, uh, their, their now peers. And so I'm, I'm excited about the, the possibilities that are there because we're enabling, we're enabling them to be able to speak up. Uh, Isaiah, along with the other students that have worked, they have come to get seven bills passed. Seven bills. And, last year, six years. and the reality is, is that they went in and spoke up and challenged our legislators to vote in ways that they might not have voted because they were there, they got the vote. Change is coming. Are you ready? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. 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 My name is Courtney Lamb, and I'm a senior at Simpson High School, and I'm going to be talking to you about my spiritual journey and how to make me a better person. God is well as known, with my mom reading Bible stories, teaching my siblings before bedtime, family prayer, God is all I've known, with my mom reading Bible stories to me and my siblings before bedtime, family prayer, attending church regularly, and playing gospel music throughout the house. And whenever I woke up to gospel music on a Saturday morning, I knew it was a clean day. <laughs> when I turned one, my family and I moved to Sacramento, and that's when we started attending St. Paul Missionary Baptist Church under the great influence of our wonderful pastor, Dr. Ethan Williams. All my life, my parents have incorporated God and the importance of having a personal relationship with our Heavenly Father. My parents made sure my siblings and I were active and involved in the church. We would attend Sunday school, Bible study, choir, as well as the praise team, help out with the clothes ministry, and Thanksgiving, Christmas dinner, and our church host every year. I'm thankful that my parents, Kevin and Black, raised my siblings in my belly. Because without them, I wouldn't be as close to God as I am now. Along my Christian journey, I've become a better person, and that has made me become involved in many activities in and outside of the church. Outside of my church, I let my light shine, and people always come up to me and tell me how I'm different from everyone 
conscience and that they see that throughout my actions. At my school, I'm the secretary of a club called Best Buddies, and this is a club where we form friendships between the regular ed students and the kids with mental disabilities. Because of my relationship with God, I'm able to show and give love as he tells us in his word. I'm happy to say that I was blessed with parents that care enough to be involved, not only spiritually, but with my education as well. My freshman year, I was automatically placed in Earth Science, Introduction to High School Math, and Regular English. Being a new high schooler, I didn't realize that those classes were for the kids that didn't get the best of grades in junior high, but I had straight A's. So my dad went up to talk to the administration, and I ended up being placed in a biology, honors English, and a higher math class. Oh, yeah. and if my dad would have never gone up to the school, I would have been in the classes that I wasn't supposed to be taking. I want to encourage the parents of the youth to be more involved with their children, so, they, so that they can catch mistakes that we may not know about, and to help us, and to lead us in practice. A lot of people think that we as young people don't have a relationship with God, but some of us do, and I got closer to him on December 2nd, 2016. That was the first preseason soccer game my sophomore year, and that was also the night I was announced captain of the team. Within the first few minutes of the game, while, while I was playing, I had the ball and I accidentally twisted my body, but my foot stayed in the same place. I injured myself, and come to find out later that month, I tore my ACL. Following that was a long process with the brace, crutches, surgery, and plenty of physical therapy. Once this event happened to me, I started praying a lot more, especially for myself, to help faster to play soccer again, and etc. But what would have helped is if I had a consistent prayer life before, because I shouldn't have prayed only when I was in need, but also to give thanks and to rejoice. I'm not saying I never praised God until my injury, but I am saying that once it happened, I saw a shift in how often I prayed and how I prayed. What did help me was believing in God and trusting Him in the process of my need. Psalms 5015 says, A call and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me. After going through all of this, I'm different today because having that small downfall made me a stronger person and built my faith in God. Plenty of times throughout the process, I asked God, why? Why does that happen to me? And this is such bad timing. Even though I thought I had all these, even though I had all these questions, God still knew what he was doing. By believing in God and trusting in his process, I was able to get back to the full mobility of my knee, and I'll be trying out for this year's soccer team on Monday. My focus isn't to just talk to you guys about some injury that happened to me, but to show you an example of how trusting and believing in God is an important part of anybody's spiritual journey, even when it seems like there's no hope. Nobody said that this journey was going to be easy, so trusting in God in worry times can show you how powerful He is. The problem is that the youth nowadays let temporary problems have permanent effects on their lives, and they don't look at these problems as something that they can overcome. For example, struggling with schoolwork, learning in an environment surrounded by nobody that looks like you, problems at home, problems in society, and many more. Things happen, but you don't realize that with God, He'll come through, just like He did with me and my injury. Till this day, I have this scar from surgery, but it symbolizes multiple things. It reminds me of the hardship God put me through, but it also reminds me of how He helped me overcome that struggle and to not let it stop me. On productivity of my life. Overall, I want you to know that with this spiritual journey, it can improve you as a person, even if there's trials and tribulations. Also, for the parents, I would like to say, be involved in your youth school lives and lives in general, because you guys are the people we look up to and go to for advice. I would like to say thank you to the National Sacramento Section for having me. We really appreciate your words. Let's see what your mentor does. Hello, my name is Gianna Lewis, and my husband and I are the um, chair and co-chairpersons of the youth ministry at St. Paul, which Courtney is a very uh, prominent person, a very helpful person within that ministry. We turn to Courtney for a lot of different things within that ministry because Courtney is a person who loves the Lord and who lets her light shine from the light shine from her in anything that she does. Um, just heard Courtney speak about 
her journey um, and how her parents have incorporated God in her life, how she went through some struggles that made her more, a, strong, a stronger person, how her prayer life became more, more important and changed when she went through the struggles in her life. And as I listened to Courtney, as I read her story, I thought about um, Proverbs 22.6 where it says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Courtney mentioned also that most of all, she was blessed to have her parents in her spiritual life as well as in her, um, her life at home, uh, in her life at school. And so I say to the parents today, love your children. Spend time with your children. Lift your children. Encourage your children. Give your children limitations. Discipline them. Be yes. there for them. Um, don't let them walk this journey on their own. We need to be there for them to support them. And that is what Courtney's parents has done for her. We need to lead them, instruct them. Uh, we need to laugh with them, have a good time with them. And most of all, just be there for them. Through their spiritual walk in school, through their life at home, we just need to be there with them. And as their youth leaders, you know, as they say, it takes a village to raise a child. As their youth leaders, we are trying to be part of that village. We know that there's single parents. We know that there's grandparents. We know that there's uh, children out there that have no parents. So we can't replace their parents, but we try to be there with them. We try to be an outlet for them. So when we're doing Bible study, we give that child an opportunity to tell us, how's your day going? How was your week? What are you going through? Is there anything that you need? We try to help them in any way we possibly can. Um, we feed them. We don't know when a child has had their, a meal, their last meal. We feed them every Wednesday. We feed that child. But we try to be part of that community. And as I said, Courtney is, plays a big role in our youth ministry. She is there for us in anything that we do, and I appreciate her very much. Courtney, do you have issues with other students I wouldn't say I have. Let's wait for the Okay. Um, I wouldn't say I have issues with people at school, but then knowing that I am a follower of God, they do say that they try to limit themselves and how they act around me. So I'm not really problems, but they know how to like act a certain way to me. And I told them like they don't really have to limit themselves, but they do know that. I am a Christian and that I follow God and yeah. We're on our own. Okay, Regina Bryan was diagnosed with major depressive disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder when she was 13 years old. Since becoming more stable in her recovery, she has dedicated her life to mental health advocacy. In 2018, she received her bachelor's degree in social work from Sacramento State University and now works as a housing and resource specialist for STARS Behavioral Health Group, helping transitional aged youth living with mental illness, uh, secure housing and other resources. Then we have uh, David Bain. David is the executive director for NAMI Sacramento, the local affiliate for the National Alliance for Mental Illness. He has been with the organization for seven years, the first three on the board of directors, and now serving as the executive director. David also spent six years on the City of Sacramento's Disability Advisory Committee. In his role as director, David runs the day-to-day -day operations of an organization dedicated to improving the lives of people living with mental illness and the lives of those who love someone living with mental illness. He is a passionate advocate for mental health parity and strives to normalize conversations about mental illness. Let's welcome We'll begin with you. Thank you. So, I am not African American, but I'm nonetheless grateful that I was invited here. So, thank you for having me. Um, I would like to start off that usually when I tell my story, 
Um, I grew up in a Latin household. My mother is white, but my father is Hispanic, and I was raised by my grandmother. My grandmother was very proud of her Latin culture. Some of the things that she taught me was the importance of family. God first, family second, but that was the main one. And also, if you were ever sick and had to deal with an illness, you relied on prayer and lots of paperwork. And that was how our culture dealt with illness. I brought her around a lot of abuse, substance use with relatives. My father had been incarcerated for the majority of my life, and I had to deal with a lot of instability growing up. A lot of these factors played into my mental illness. Um, I had been abused by a family member, and that had led to me having a fear of very loud sounds. So the example of this is called hypervigilance, that if someone would just slam a door, a normal reaction would be to kind of just shake, not to run and scream and feel that you're being attacked by somebody. Over the years of my childhood, I had dealt with restlessness, paranoia, hopelessness. And my family wanted what's best for me. They would tell me that you can do it. You just gotta be strong. You can pick it up. You can just snap out of it. It will be okay. But it never quite got better. My personal favorite was my grandmother always said, you gotta be strong. You're a Mexican, not a Mexican. <laughs> I still say that to myself sometimes when I need a little bit of inspiration. But that didn't deal with the symptoms that I was facing. And in my household, mental illness was not talked about. We just had to be strong. So when I was diagnosed at the age of 13 with depression and post-traumatic stress disorder, my family didn't quite understand what that meant. I needed to pray more. I needed to devote myself to God. I needed to devote myself to my family. I should look at how strong my relatives are and be just like them. And I wanted nothing more than to be strong for myself and for my family. And so, after trying and not succeeding, I had made my first suicide attempt at age 14. Where my family, instead of being advised and saying that it was okay, I was told that God only had the right to choose when we live or when we die. And that if I wanted to really be involved in recovery, I just need to stop the medication and I needed to stop the therapy. And that's what I did. I devoted myself to my family and my faith and my education. I covered my body in paper wrap because that was what I was taught. And although I never quite lost my faith in God, I still attend Mass every Sunday. My symptoms had only begun to get worse. I would either feel too intensely or not at all. I wouldn't address the trauma, so I engaged in substance use. Sometimes I would check out or dissociate from reality and come to and not know where I was. All of these led to a point that when I was 18 years old, I became homeless while trying to finish my senior year in high school. I had gotten into college being the first in my family to do so and flunked out my first year because I couldn't handle my symptoms. All that time, my family had not known what to do with me, and due to the instability in my home, I went through the foster care system. So, so much instability and not being able to cope that I felt that it was all on me, that I just was too weak to deal with the real world. It wasn't until I had lived with a family member in Sacramento in 2015, my godmother, who had taken me to my first Nami walk. For the first time in public, I heard somebody talk about mental illness. For the first time, I heard somebody say that there was an explanation, a chemical imbalance of why I was acting the way that I was acting. Of course, nurture plays a part, but it's much bigger than my experiences. There was a name. From there, I went to college at Sac State, and when I had my first breakdown, I knew where to go. I went to my counseling center, I received services, I was put on medication, and I was able to start my recovery with the support of my then boyfriend and very close friends, including a foster group community that I had met at Sac State. In receiving that treatment, I was able to do things I could never imagine, like graduate with a bachelor's degree, get married, hold a full-time job, 
and learn how to repair those relationships with my family because that was what was important to me. All of this because I decided to confront my illnesses head on. And I learned that along my journey that my weakness wasn't trying and not getting it. My true strength, uh, my true weakness was from not confronting it at all. My strength came from when I was able to say that I had a problem and I wanted help. I understand that in family dynamics, things are different. In my household, we didn't talk about it. And I never had anyone say that they were proud of me or they were going to support me. And I think that was, gonna, that was helpful in my recovery. And I'll give you an example. In 2016, I was placed on a psychiatric hold in the hospital. You may be hearing me familiar with the term 5150. I am deemed to be a danger to myself, and I have been hospitalized. Upon my release from the hospital, my younger brother, who I had come through a similar journey with me of abuse and instability, visited me at my home the next day, not knowing what had happened. But I found myself pouring my heart and soul out to him. The only thing he had asked me is if it was his fault of what I had happened to me. And I told him, of course not. This is much bigger than you, but I'm going to work on it and I'm going to get help. And what he had told me was, I don't understand, but I love you anyways, and I'm willing to learn. And in that moment, I knew that I had an ally in my own family. And that means more to me than anything. So I would say among families, support is important. It's absolutely, and I've seen it and heard it reiterated today, support is key. And whether you're a mental health advocate or may not know who that, that is, the ability to learn about the resources that are out there, they are out there. I've heard from a church that I went to that God has given us wonderful gifts. And one of the wonderful gifts he gives us is the community resources that we have and the people who are willing to help. And involve, if you're seeing somebody in your family who are exhibiting symptoms that you may not know, Along with researching them, just let them know that even if you don't understand, you still love them. You're still proud of them. Because for me, that's why I'm able to sit here today and tell you all the amazing things that I've done. The support of family is above all else. Thank you. Thank you for having us here today. We really appreciate being able to get our message out. Uh, seven years ago, I was looking for a new organization to uh, help out, and I came across NAMI, and I really liked the look of it. Um, it was founded in the 70s. Back then, psychiatric hospitals were emptying out and sending patients home with a bottle of pills and no instructions. So family members didn't know what to do, and no one was helping them out. The community-based programs didn't really exist very much back then. So family members started gathering themselves, in their basements, in their kitchens, what have you, and offering each other support and sharing with each other whatever information they could glean about mental illness and how to support their loved ones. So we were founded as a family support organization. Um, and then in 1983, somebody went around the country, grabbed all these disparate groups, and gathered them into NAMI. And from there, we created our official programs of uh, family support and family to family, which is a class that helps family members and everything we do is on the experience, so it's family members helping family members. And then we started creating those same programs for the people who are living with a mental health issue. So we have support groups for that, and we have a class called Peer to Peer. And then we do also presentations in the community to get rid of the stigma and the discrimination that comes with living with a mental health condition. So, um, I have a few statistics for you. One in five people are uh, impacted by mental illness. So consider the people in this room, 20% of the people in this room are living with a mental illness. Um, the county that we live in, there is uh, 1.5 million people. And using that statistic of the one in five, that means of 1.5 million people, over 270,000 are living with a mental illness. So the issue is quite large. There's no racial, cultural, uh, gender, or socioeconomic barrier to mental illness. Anybody can get it. 
whether it's genetic or environmental or trauma-based, anybody can be impacted by mental illness and it can come at any point in their life. Typically the age ranges are 14 to 24. So that's when you know we're really trying to do the type of outreach and, and hit those kids early because there's eight to 10 years of uh, delay on the average right now for when people are first diagnosed to when they actually get into treatment. And the longer that delay is, the more uh, catastrophic the impact is over the long-term person of, uh, of their life. So things like homelessness and drug abuse and um, suicide, that's uh, an awful, a big indicator. So we're trying to uh, improve that by bringing our programs to kids, but also to parents. <coughs> uh, for kids, 50% of the people who live with a, a disorder develop that, start showing symptoms by the age of 14. 75% have started by 24. Uh, approximately 50% of kids over 15 and living with an untreated disorder drop out of school. Approximately 70% of the youth in the state and local juvenile uh, justice system have an untreated mental health disorder. 70. Suicide is the second leading cause of death in teenagers. 90% of the youth who have died by suicide have an underlying disorder. For some good news, suicide is a preventable, preventable cause of death. We can't help that. Now, Gina has shown it is quite possible for someone to be impacted at a young age and still come out on top. She's doing a fantastic job. She's got a, a job in her career field, and she's got lots of friends and a successful career. So, good job. do a lot of outreach into the community. We've got a table back there right now. You can go back there and talk to uh, Jesse or Brandy and find out more information about us. But when we do uh, outreach events in the community, I find a lot of people when they come up, I tell them about what we do. They say, well, this sounds great for my loved one or my friend. And I say, well, no, this is also great for you. Because uh, we're talking about the most complex organ of the body. That's the brain. And so people can't do that alone. It's very difficult to try to fix this issue to address your mental health by yourself. And so they need family members and they need friends to be engaged. If I were to break my leg, a family member or a friend would take me to the hospital. They wouldn't just walk away and, and not know what to do with me. Uh, if I have you know, going to the hospital, family and friends are going to come see me. They're not going to avoid me. And right now, when people come out and they say, I have a mental health issue, the typical response is denial, uh, awkward silence, or, uh, or avoidance. And that's not helping the individual, and it's not helping the greater family, because that impact does spread across the family. So again, we have our programs. I, I, I advocate strongly for family members to be involved uh, and to inform themselves, to get support, either through your own avenues, uh, or come through NAMI, or other organizations that are out there. Get the education, find out as much as you can about your loved one's diagnosis, so that way you know what's going on, and that way you can support them. But also make sure you're taking care of yourself, because I've seen family members who have gone 100% for their loved one, and sometimes there's siblings that get left out, and sometimes the family member themselves, uh, they end up burning out, at some point in their life, they have to tell their uh, ill loved one, go away. And it's a heartbreaking decision for people to have to make. But this is a thing where there's no cure for brain disorders. There's only treatment. And so you're talking about some people who for 20, 30, 40 years are gonna be living with this sort of thing. So you have a parent who is strongly active in trying to maintain their child's health, is doing that for 60 or 70 or 80 years, and they can't. So at some point, you've got to make sure you're taking care of yourself so you can also take care of your loved one. You can't pour tea from an empty cup. Thank you. Glad you uh, had the ability to come and sit with us and, and, and talk about some of the, uh, the things that are most important to you. Uh, I have a question for both of you before I uh, turn, over, turn, up, turn over the question to the audience. And that is, what do you say to school officials and what do you say to teachers 
terms of identifying students who may be suffering and need and be in need of help. So um, part of when I got my social work degree, I actually did an internship uh, at a middle school in Sac City Unified School District. And they have um, student support centers where you can go if you're in need of help and they do um, assessments. And they also have, you know, if you, you know, want to talk to a school official and say, you know, I'm just interested because you know, all of it comes from the self-interest of your child. So I'm concerned about my child, is there anything I can do? A lot of these support centers and counseling centers also know kind of where in the community you can get help. We have information, you know, about Medi-Cal, different insurances. Um, but it's, you know, best to go to those centers as a start to you so that they can give you the resources to move elsewhere. Um, but those are the main holes in your schools that you would want to go to. Uh, sometimes we see uh, cases of withdrawal. That's a major personality change for your child. Uh, usually it's with, with being withdrawn, uh, becoming very angry or irritable. Uh, sometimes it's a matter of you'll see cutting. Sometimes you might see them cutting themselves or you'll see cuts on them that, that they can't explain. And sometimes, hopefully, they'll actually come to you and say something. Uh, whether you're a teacher or a parent, uh, slow down and listen to them. Because oftentimes, what I've heard back from kids is, is I approached my parent or I approached a teacher and I, and I said something, but I got blown off as being teenage hormones. And unfortunately, there is a little bit of similarity between a kid who becomes sullen and irritable and cranky, and they might just be 14 years old, but they might be developing a mental health issue. So that's where you need to slow down and take some time and have a discussion with them but also make sure you're going out and informing yourself. Don't just upfront deny it, because that will lead to the kid going elsewhere, possibly uh, self-medicating, possibly running away. So just my big thing is to slow down and get some support, to listen to the kid and get some information for yourself. Any questions? Oh, my hands went up. A runner, can I run from home? We're going to get it for them. 
And it doesn't mean that we're crazy. It just means that we need help and we may need a little medication to help us be normal and sit in class and learn and graduate and be functional people. I noticed that, at least I was told, that Kaiser has something over there about mental health as well. So let's do it. And if you belong to Kaiser, just go out and get some help. <laughs> and, and, and while I have the mic, we're going to ask uh, the people who spoke already to come back. We, we're running, we're really in good time. Come back and we're going to ask some questions and talk some more. Services. And so I'm just interested in how, um, how services are being delivered to children in the school setting. Um, I think also about, and, and I know health plans also are supposed to be widening their services for mental health. And um, is it, is it uh, culturally relevant? Is it also offering counseling? And a lot of times, you know, we want to give kids medication, but a lot of times we just need someone to talk to. And so is that funding allowing flexibility, I guess is what I'm asking. Is it allowing flexibility in how services are provided to children and their families? Uh, we're not seeing the effect yet of a whole lot in the way of funding. Uh, we do a program that we, a uh, presentation program called In the Silence for Middle and High School Kids. Uh, we offer that at no cost. Our problem is actually getting into the schools. Um, and usually schools are reactionary versus being proactive. So after something happens, then they'll bring us in. Uh, so that's been our, our issue there. We have a program also called Mommy on Campus, which is this club, like French club or chess club, but it's a mental illness awareness club. So the kids work on that. Uh, I would like to bring support groups in. I've done some workshops at a couple of high schools and I've had kids ask, ask for support groups. So that's something that I'm working on ourselves with our capacity. We're a small organization, but we're trying to have a big impact. And so uh, we're working now with the Sac City Unified School District to try to improve that. Thank you. I'm going to begin with a question for uh, my students here. And if adults want to join, that's, that, that, that's fine as well. Uh, I can remember being a baby boomer uh, and being a high school principal as well. That when I had a flight on campus, uh, students would come and see me and I would find out what happened and I do what I could to make sure it wouldn't happen again. And then I'd send them home for a few days on what we call a suspension. Well, things don't look like that anymore. Typically now in high schools, students are not always suspended, but the police are called in and they're cited, and they're forced to go to court. It's what we call double jeopardy. I want to find out what the students feel about that. We'll begin with you, and then we'll pass the mic down. So, with the police being involved, with the fights, I feel like they're giving that towards the black students, because usually on campus, um, it's like known for the black students to be involved in fights and um, different situations like that. So yes, it's good to like help get, to help them and to not let it happen again on campus. But for the double jeopardy, yes. Um, I don't know too much about that, but yeah, that's for um, when the fights happen. So. If that's what's happening nowadays, and that's now not how it was back then, then there must have been a... Just how people look at us nowadays. Thank you. Isaiah? So I also about um, the policing on campus. Uh, I feel the the reason for it is like this is true as far as how they use it now. Um, at times they really can't use it against the student. And it's really supposed to be for the protection of the actual school itself from maybe external things outside of the school. Um, but I feel oftentimes it's not the external uh, proactiveness is not used, it's more used to just target a lot of kids. And as far as the targeting part, I don't agree with it. And I don't feel that it should be used in that way. So. Randall, do you want to address that? I think that um, 
change most currently. Um, then we need to reset how the police are being used on our campuses. Uh, there's a, a young man now, Justin Brown, who is seeking to bring that kind of change, but at the same time, we, as community members, as parents and adults, we need to really be assessing how police are being used. Um, and like uh, Isaiah said, it's, it's usually, and also he said that it's usually a target situation. And and it's not supposed to be done that way. There, there are counselors, there are support systems on campus so that they don't have to bring in police. There's a way to do it without bringing in police, especially psychic students. That is just, to me, absolutely unnecessary. They can do it in a different way. I would agree that it can be done in a different way. I believe that um, on the school campuses, they have campus security. I believe that they should use the security that they have, but depending on the severity of the, the issue or the fight or what's going on, is when they need to call in um, additional help. But other than that, I think that they should use the um, campus security that they have Mr. Banks. Uh, this kind of ties into the latest question here. Uh, I just met with someone the other day and said right now in the state of California there's one counselor for every thousand children. That's the average throughout the state. And there are more security officers employed than there are counselors. So that's a big problem. And from the parents I've talked to, there's a wide difference between what schools will do when a fight actually occurs versus bullying. Right now, there's still, it seems like there's nothing being done about bullying. And so there's no proactive work being done there when the bullying starts and then the fight occurs and then the school is being overly harsh with their uh, punishments. So yeah, it needs to be addressed. I think the schools will be more proactive, hopefully, that, and more counselors, there'll be less fights and hopefully it's so uh, equally uh, justified across the population. Jay, did you want to speak on that? Okay. So, I'm, I personally, I don't believe I personally attend this school and I haven't been able to go to those instances and going more and more and definitely affecting um, students of color. I do believe that like restorative justice practices instead of suspending them, instead of bringing all the security, bringing the students together with the school, with the parents, and kind of having that conversation of what's going on, how can we do this without bringing, um, you know, such, you know, police and security, because that in itself can be traumatizing to the students, you know? It's not, there's not going to be less focus on their education if they're worried about if somebody picks on me and I get in a fight, what's going to happen? Um, so definitely different practices. Appreciate it. I was called out to a school in Elk Grove High School by a parent who was concerned that her daughter was being bullied. And take that uh, from uh, Mr. Bain's suggestion that bullying is definitely a critical issue that our youth uh, have to deal with. And it gets crazier when it takes on the cyber uh, nature of bullying. And in this particular situation, uh, a young lady, African American female, was just continually being bullied by uh, an old friend of hers, and she could get stopped every time she looked at her phone. There was a no, there was this, there was that, and it just simply wouldn't stop. And so the mother went out, went to the school principal, and says, "Look, you guys are going to have to do something. These are kids that attend the school, and I'm tired of them bullying my daughter. I mean, she's in tears. She can't." Cope. She's in the bathroom crying in the day. She can't get her lessons done. And on and on and on. And I think we had to go to three meetings before we could bring resolution to this issue. How does that, how do panelists, uh, what do you feel about uh, cyberbullying and what can we do as a community to decrease the impact? Um, with bullying, I feel like it's not it all starts at home with the kids who do the bullying. So the parents, you need to pay attention to your children. And if they're acting um, a 
certain way. And that could reflect on how they act at school. And so to help decrease it, we can start by just having some conversation with kids. Because sometimes it's the bully who actually needs the help. So um, to just talk to them and to help them, and that's the way we can decrease it and to let them know that there's people that will help. Um, to speak to the bullying, I feel I agree with what you said as well as also we have to be able to hold other students accountable. Um, so when we see it, instead of just watching it or trying to ignore it, or it's just bullying that happens, you have to, in that sense, um, be reactive to it and stop it right there or at least address it um, in a way that it, or bring it to somebody's attention so that it is addressed because oftentimes it's just not addressed. And when that happens, then you there's really, from there, it's, it's extensive bullying and it just happens and continues to happen instead of at least addressing it so it can, in some way, be solved how it has to be. So. I agree with both of the students I've looked at it as I believe that the parents need to be more involved. They need to know more of what their children are doing um, on the cyber spaces, the Facebooks and the tweets and whatever else they're using. Because bullying is a serious act and someone will and can be hurt. Um, my children are much older and they didn't have the, the Facebooks and things at that time. But at one point, my son was being bullied and what he did to try to protect himself is he took a hammer to school. But because the bus driver was made aware of it, no one was hurt in that instance. But nowadays, things are even more severe now. So you really, are, well, parents need to really pay attention to what their children are doing. We need to go on their Facebooks and their web pages and follow and see what they're doing. I mean, I have a son that, whatever age I want to say, but I still follow his Facebook and I still go on there and tell him, take that down. That's not correct. Apologize. I still follow him. And I just think that our parents, we still need to do that. The, the other thing is um, adults and parents, please join the parent organizations at the school. Say. Please, please, please join the parent organizations so that you can go as a force rather than trying to handle it on your own because you don't get as far as fast on your own. But when you can actually join and find out if there is or literally become a part of the Black Parallel School Board because that's where we're really taking action, it is important that we do this. We've got to, the only way we're going to bring change is that we become a united front. And we have the, we do have the things, we do have the tools and the, the ways that we can come together and that can actually make a difference. I would definitely agree with everything. Like for me, when I looked into my mom, one of the things before I could even get social media was she had to have passwords and had to have all the access. And that was a mutually agreed upon conversation that this is what you have, but also like informing your kids of like internet safety and the stuff that can go on online. And also observing the behavior, whether your child is the bully or the one being bullied. Because I, I do have a look for a period of if I was being bullied, I go home and at least have a safe until the next day. But when it's on your phone and on your computer and being spread around to your friends, it's non-stop. And it can take a toll on someone's psyche. So making sure you're checking in with your kids and if you notice a change in those behaviors, you know, it could be that they are being bullied. And then having those access to their social media or having that conversation with them about, you know, what's going on so that you can be the best advocate. Parents are the best, the first and best advocates, the first and best teachers for these kids. It's, it's really interesting, and, and I think uh, you're right. I, I hear a lot of people talk about the parents side of bullying when you look at cyberbullying. One of the things that, that's crucial to understand is when you look at Facebook and Google, 
Their value is to get people to look at the phone. And they've created all kinds of techniques to get whoever the phone owner is to look, constantly look. Because it trains them. It becomes addictive. And if you, if you have a kid who cannot put their phone down, and you have a kid like that, they're always constantly looking. We have to teach our kids that there's time for phone and there's time for no phone. Because we don't want to create this addictive kind of behavior. speakers. Uh, this will be the first and we'll have one after that. Uh, the student or the youth speaker gets 15 minutes. The uh, mentor gets 10 minutes and then we'll have questions for a total of about 31 minutes. Thanks. We can move forward. Uh, 
I want to present to you right now Sally Caldwell. Uh, he's going to speak to us today, and let me tell you just a little bit about him. After his father realized Marcellus had a special talent and a compassion for building, the family invested into an income property. Marcellus could explore more of his remodeling potentials. Within a month of Marcellus's adventure of working on his future first custom home, he and his brother went roller skating in the area to check out new neighbors and the many different styles of homes in the area. While one neighbor offered some barbecue, being it was Memorial Day, started out to be a friendly introduction until an unknown car came around the corner and shot five people, shooting Marcellus in the head. Marcellus, or Sally as he likes to be called, injuries were so severe they left him hospitalized for several months. Although he survived, his dreams and plans have changed. No suspects have ever been detained or arrested. Let's listen to Marcellus. Hey, how are you guys doing?
situation like this, it would be mean and cranky. And it's not good like that, because you can't really get around being mean and stuff. Because they're not, they're not going to mess with you. Straight A student. I told him I said you can do anything you can do. 
can be it. And guess what? Right now, my son, anything you want to be, you can still be it. He also got about um, being a what is it? Computer software designer. And so he was still doing it. He got a prospect. And you know, instead of you know making those violent games, make some games that create a rareness to our young individual who you hang it with. You go over somebody's house, you really don't know who they are. You, you can't, you know, you really don't know who they are. You have to know who they are and who they hang with. You know, because guns don't have names on them. And if you carry in a gun, somebody knows you carry in a gun. So get away from them. Run as fast as you can. Tell them. That's what I was saying. Tell them. Tell them. So we started a foundation. The Air of our son James Caldwell Foundation to prevent gun violence here in Sarah Family. All over the world. Let's just start here. And it, what we do is every Memorial Day, we walk from the foundation to the crime scene. And my hope and wish is all these innocent victims here in Sarah are getting shot. No one knows who it is. All it takes is one person to break an alibi. Walk on that walk. Blow that victim picture up. All somebody has to say is, he wasn't with that girl, he was that 7-Eleven. Breaks the alibi. Let's get these shooters off the street. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. So, um, we have any questions?
So I feel strong. I still feel a, a lot of faith and honor and direction. But something that jumped on me, I don't know if it's a bad spirit, I don't know what it is, but something that jumped on me since you've been shot, it's like I'm in a box. So I need support. I need, hey girl, what you doing today? You know, um, can I help you with anything? You know, because me and Marcel have been home for over two years. You know, and every time you're ready to go somewhere, he's going back to the hospital, or, you know, you haven't, um, Kaiser had blocked his home health for the first year of his condition because they said he didn't qualify for home health. And so I found out he did. But the whole year was critical for our son's rehab, his wound care. Um, it's just his resources are not there. We have to go out and find them and we search them on our own.
can do for themselves internally, you know, to provoke young African American leaders and to be, you know, to provoke young African American leaders and to be better advocates for themselves. And I'm really excited to, be, to, to do this because I finally get to tell grown-ups what to do, you know? I really feel grown doing this right now. So, um, all right, so the first thing you guys can do, and I'll have one point for you guys, one point for you guys, and it's to be emotionally and morally mature. And what I mean by this is, the first thing, I got two points under that, and it's to practice what you preach, do what you teach. If you're gonna have a specific moral code or guidelines, you have to be following it. Say you say, say you tell your youth or your child, always open the door for elders, or never talk down to yourself, but you're doing that. Yes, we should follow your rules, but it's making you see, it's making you seem less credible, you know, than you are. It's really important to follow your own moral code because once you do that, now as we're walking along this journey to become leaders and better advocates for ourselves, when we form our own moral code, now we are not only you know, saying what we have to say, but we're practicing what we're preaching. You're teaching us to be men and women of our words. Um, the second thing you guys should do is not letting everything bother you. Like, not, not letting people's words or incidents or certain things bother you. And what do I mean by this is not letting everything get you out of your character. And that's what I feel like a lot of adults um, need to fix. And this is really important in cultivating leaders and young advocates for themselves because, like, you guys are all role models, right? Everybody, just assume that somebody is looking up to you. So when the person you're mentoring or your child is looking up to you and saying, oh, well, my mom, my mentor is letting the world offer what they're supposed to do. Now I'm gonna subconsciously do it. And it's not helping build our character. You know, it's de-elevating it. Um, so now I'm gonna talk about emotional support, how you guys can emotionally support us. And the first thing I have to say is, stop protecting us from backlash and criticism. Um, this is extremely important. In the world, there's going to be depression, there's going to be fear, there's going to be anxiety, there's going to be heartbreak, there's going to be a lot of things. And as horrible as it is, I feel like it personally, it builds character, but it's really important that we have the constructive criticism. Um, something about me is I am a control freak, okay? You don't want to be with me when I'm in group projects because I'll do everything. Like, I don't like when other people do stuff for me because I feel like I get things officially done. I'm the only person who can do that. I'm the only person who can do it thoroughly, you know? And somebody told me, Ayana, you need to step back and let other people grow and do it for themselves because how are they gonna learn if you do everything for them, you know? And it's that constructive criticism that grew me to who I am today or say your son or your daughter wants to play basketball. They're good at basketball, but they're a ball hog. They don't want to share the ball with nobody. Now, don't say, oh, you suck, you need to be on the team, they're this, they're that. It's constructively criticism. Start off with something that's good. You know, start off with something that's good about their craft or what they do or something internally about them. And then you say it with something that can help them become better. And then end it off with something good as well. That's what, that's efficient, constructive criticism to me. Um, this is cultivating leaders and better, you know, you have to see because it's not only really perfecting the craft, but they're becoming the best versions of themselves. And it's important that, you know, they be open to constructive criticism throughout life because not everybody is going to particularly be on their side or just praise them for everything they do. Um, the next thing I have to say for emotional support is authenticity. Um, like the lady said, authenticity is the quality of being authentic. Um, it's not exactly a who you are, but it's a what you are, because who you are is consistently changing, but what you are, it's in you, it's not changing. And it's really important, so what this has to do, what this has to do with you is, you should always be striving to, you know, make your child be truly who they are, you know? I'm not saying do not elevate them and do not push their potential that they have, because I feel like every born leader has some sort of potential, potential, but they just need a little push. But the thing is, sometimes a lot of grown-ups, they try to put their expectations on us. And the thing is, if it's in us, it's in us. And if it's not, it's not, you know? You should always be trying to help us, you know, be who we are and make us realize how important, you know, our future is, but try to not deter us from actually who we are. 
um, this is really important to cultivate leaders and you know youth advocates because for me it's really important for you know cultivating leaders because I feel like once you support your child in their you know authenticity then they become more comfortable with themselves and the more comfortable they are with themselves like oh my mom or my role model or my mentor is you know confident in myself now I'm more confident in myself and I believe in myself and the more confident they are equals more comfortability and more comfortability equals oh now I'm more comfortable to lead a group of people or not only that but I'm more comfortable to speak my truth um, the third thing I would like to say for emotional support is keeping us accountable. Um, raise your hand at, if, as a youth, you made a lot of mistakes. Yes, everybody's hand should be up. <laughs> right. And the thing with that is, like, I feel like everybody makes mistakes, but when you're a teenager, like, you make a lot of mistakes. And I think it's really essential that you start off young. You try to get out those habits now. So, I'm going to tell y'all a story, and I used to be uncomfortable with telling this story, but I'm going to tell you. So, when I was eight, I was obsessed with pins, like really obsessed with pins. It was a weird obsession I had. And it was around Christmas time. And my mom took me to the store, she took me to Walmart, and she was like, come on, alright, tell me what you want on your list, you know. And I said, mom, I want pins. And I took her to the section. And I was like, mom, can I have these pens? And she said, maybe. And my heart dropped because when my mom says maybe, that means no. Okay? So I took it upon myself to put the pins in my shirt and walk out the store with them. I know, it, it's bad. And see, I got away with it temporarily, you know. When we got home, I had a field trip the next day. And I was like, mom, can you sign my permission slip? And she was like, all right. So my smart self decided to take the pins out of my jacket and give that to her to sign with. And she said, aren't those the pins from the store? And there was really no point in line. And I was like, yeah. And what she did was, see, most of my friend's parents would have just said, don't do it next time, or throw the pins away. But what she told me to do, we walked all the way back to the store, and y'all, that was a mission. We walked all the way back to the store. She took me to the security guard and the manager, and she made me apologize. And the thing with that is, she kept me accountable for my actions, and I was embarrassed at first, but looking back on it, I really am thankful for her. You know, accountability is really important when you're trying to cultivate leaders and better advocates, because once you, you know, once you keep them accountable, you're not going to have to do it forever, because now they're keeping themselves accountable, uh, which I'm doing to this day. Now, aside from emotional support, the last thing I have for you guys is external support. So what can you do environmental-wise? And I think it's really essential that we have more youth organizations, um, youth or, or youth-involved organizations. Youth-involved organizations are organizations that are centered primarily around youth, or not just if it's not centered around youth, they encourage you know, youth presence. An example of a youth organization is MWLA, Women's Men's Leadership Academy, or Black Lives Matter. They're not youth-centered, but they greatly encourage youth, or youth service America, or different things like that. And it's really important that we have youth organizations because youth organizations have three key components in just support and leaders. They have mentors, they have lessons, and they have empowerment. Mentors are really important when you're trying to gain support because Thankful to my mentors over here, I can do this. I can get up and talk to you guys as confident as I can. And I can articulate my words in a certain way. Um, youth organizations, they have lessons. I feel like the educational system right now is failing us. You know, I feel like all around the edu edu educational, system, educational system should be teaching us not just education, but lifelong, you know, Exactly, lessons. And youth organizations, I feel like they don't just teach education, but they teach us things that we can take with us along our journey that we won't forget. And the third thing is empowerment. Um, it's extremely, extremely important um, to gain confidence. And youth organizations empower not just people, but you know, youth all around. And it's important to have youth organizations because, like I said, they help build your personalities. And the last thing I want to say is support, support, support. You know, you can 
tell your youth, oh, I believe in you, I trust in you, and you're going to do great at this, but if you never show up to what's important to them, it kind of contradicts to what you're saying. So say your daughter or son, they like to play the piano, and you say, oh, go break a leg or something like that. But when they look up at the stage, you're never there. You know, it's extremely important that you are engaged in what you know, your youth or your child is trying to do because not only are you saying that you support them verbally, but you're physically there. And I feel like when you're supporting your youth, it's important that it's, it's that balance. You need to be there, show up, but you also need to encourage them, you know, mentally. Um, and yeah, that's it. Thank you. The, the thing that, that really stood out to me for both of them as I uh, sat back and just listened, um, I took um, a chance as a mentor. I did not pre-listen. When they were outside, I did not go out and coach them. I wanted to see what, what would come from their heart. I wanted to see how they would develop this first TED Talk and be, be the influence that they need to be to their peers. Why am I sharing this with you? Um, for the adults that, that are left, that did stay, I want to say to you, this is kind of what young people need. I don't know why people left. I don't know what was on their agenda today. But to me, unless they stay to the end, they miss the point. Right, right. And so my, my whole thing, um, and I hope you see the video, no condemnation, but the reality is, is that we've got to stay put for our young people. We've got to be able to give them support. She just said, that was the last thing she said, support, support, support. And so I applaud those who have stayed. Whether you're on the committee or whether you, you know, like, because you have to be here. From this point, choose to be here because you want to be here. That's the most important thing. Our young people are, are going through so much. Um, I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to pray with this one. I used to be, I was one of the former youth ministers in Calvary Christian Center. But I remember the day that I had to, in Oakland, when I had to work with the family for four hours while they waited on their son to die. It was one of the most challenging moments in my life. I'll never forget that. And being able to work with them and stay in that room. Grandmama had a heart condition. Um, the sister was hysterical. They literally brought her in, holding her by her hands and her feet, one on one on each limb, and as she just and it was and Grandma had to watch this, and then the other family members that came in, and so then I pulled the other guys that were there um, that were his uh, street entrepreneur friends. I had to, you know, like I just pulled to the front. I said, see this? Do you really want this for your mom? Do you really want this for your dad? They turned their lives around that day. Some of them gave their lives to Christ, some of them didn't. But all of them are professionals today. The one that I know for sure is an engineer. And the others are, are working and doing, living their lives and, and family members. Why am I saying this? Because it's again, that happened in 1988. And I'm still connected with those young people today. My oldest mentee is. 52 years old. I'm still connected to him. 
he just retired earlier and he's doing big things in Houston. And he contacted me to pray with him because I was with him when he made every major transition in his life. When I say that you are important and your staying ability is vital, I really mean it because I live it. I'm still doing it. I'm 37 years in this game. I've been working here in the school systems and in, with youth here in Sacramento since 1992 when I got here. So my, 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 my encouragement to those of you who are youth practitioners, don't stop. Stick with it. Stay with it. My encouragement to young people, keep doing what you're doing to make your lives better. Keep rising humbly and see how you can help your peers make a difference, bring change, and do what is needed to make their world, your world, our world, a better place. Thank you. All right, folks, questions? I think they want you to use a microphone because you're being, we're recording.
functions, activities, so that they can see the unity and harmony that can be between adults, 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 that can be between adults. I guess I've been doing poetry too long, huh? That can be between adults. Because it really can be if everybody chooses to do so. If everybody would just be able to say, Daryl, Daryl Roberts, Rick Jennings, crying to you, bring us together so that we can do it together better. And I know God will give you the way, because you're the biggest organization in the city. How can we do it better? How can we do more together? That's what's going to be really vital to now. Thank you.
like the people that's in power now, they're implementing rules, like based on stereotypes. And not only that, but they're not making it a safe space anymore emotionally. You know, and I feel like that's really important when you're in school. So yeah, that's basically it. Can you repeat that again, please? Using the microphone? I think you shared 
grace with all of us, how you can recover from something that is so catastrophic. Thank you for spending time with us today, and again, continue to listen. Thank you. <laughs> I shouldn't. I'm sorry. And may I ask Ms. Ayana Botan to come? <laughs> Ayana, I think you, we can all agree that she brought the house down, did she not? Yeah. She got our attention and she gave us a to-do list. Pretty impressive. So, Ayana, thank you for spending your time and well your very important message with us today. Continued success. I'd like to extend our hearty thanks to you today for spending time with us and hosting and mentoring the kids. We hope you can enjoy the time you spent with us. We look forward to continued relationships. Amen. You ready? Okay, here it comes from. We'll hold it just a little bit. another engagement, but I think you can see that there's an organization out there that is willing to partner with us in the health, mental health community, and we just wanted to say thank you and acknowledge his contribution. Thank you. Woo! White, dear all white, we can't thank you enough for your contribution to the success of today's program, working with the students, keeping the program moving, and uh, I would hope that we have a long term relationship with you. All right, sounds good. Appreciate Again, it. Thank you for your well, thank support. You. All right, thank you. And will uh, Jesslyn Freeman come forward and Sedaris Wesley Smith? Sedari? Sedaris? They're not here. They're not. No, you can't be. Jesslyn, thank you for supporting us today, volunteering your time. And this is just a, a certificate of our appreciation for your supporting the Children's Promise 2018. Thank you. without any pitches, and I want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And our, uh, we're going to have, I, it's on the program that I would do the closing remark. First of all, are there any uh, announcements? Yes. Thank you. I would just like to thank Ms. Tommy Whitlow for all of her um, guidance and direction and love for uh, parents and children in our community. And so on behalf of the planning committee, we'd like to present you. <laughs> and we'd also like to present the new president of the uh, National Council of Year World Women some flowers also. I have to get in here some way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you've been a great audience because when there was a wall, you still hung in there. And uh, thank those who are generous and gave to the MJ, uh, MJ, MJC Foundation. Thank you very much. Our closing remarks will be by our president. And we'll see you next year, the fourth Saturday in October. The vendors. Vendors, thank you. Exhibitors, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I am sure that people have taken things home, and it's important that when you get home and something comes up, oh, I, I went to the Children of Columbus, I have this card here, let me call that person. Thank you, thank you, thank you. In our 18th, 18th 
celebration of Children of Promise. We certainly do look forward to you in 2019. Before I leave, I just want to thank Sharon Saffold because it was her idea, it was her idea to bring a program whose name has children in it, to include the children in the program this year with a TED Talk format. So Sharon, thank you so very much for bringing us a fresh idea that I think we can continue forward in years to come. Thank all of you for the time you spent with us today. Thank you to our partners, to our sponsors. I look forward to seeing you in 2019. Thank you. Community. And so on behalf of the planning community, we'd like to present you. And we'd also like to present the new president of the uh, National Council of Bureau Women some flowers also. Woo!